Okay, uh, let's pray. I'm going to uh, introduce the book of Jeremiah, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you so much for the opportunity to meet together. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your spirit that reveals these things and lives in our hearts. We ask that we may continue to learn, that our hearts would be open to understand these things. And I do thank you so much for this, this opportunity to meet here at this, this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Jeremiah, uh, what we've got first of all is uh, I want you to open up your Bibles to 2 Kings. Let's go to 2 Kings 23. 2 Kings chapter 23 first of all. And get a little bit of background. And uh, obviously you know something about... Uh, Jeremiah and about the Old Testament and the situations. Uh, but one of the important things about Jeremiah is that the, uh, the book itself, the chapters, are not in chronological order. So while you're turning to chapter 23, I'll refer to the notes that I handed out. I'm going to try to hand out more complete notes as we go through this. Uh, this is page 2. I've got page 1 at home. I didn't bring it. But uh, you can see down the middle column right there is the chapter numbers. And then on the, this column to the immediately to the left of that is the year. We start in the year five, or excuse me, 630. And, and Josiah, you know, I mean, I know you know a lot of these things. I'm going to back up and go through a lot of it. But King Josiah, the one who found the law, and the, the book of the, or the Bible, the scriptures in the temple when they were uh, re restoring it, began a religious reform, and you can see that's in 632 is when he began the religious reform. So this chart kind of begins probably in, in Josiah's 18th year, around 630, and he's in the midst of, of reform, trying to bring reform to the nation. Uh, and, and again, I, I hate to do this, but I'll do it several times because it's on my mind. I'll, I'll say, when we were in Israel, so please apologize when I, I apologize when I say that, but when we were in Israel, we saw uh, several places, especially this place called Arad, a high place. And a high place was nothing more than a, a home Bible study that went outside of the, the, the organ, organization of the temple. God had it set up that there was supposed to be a temple. And in the temple where there was, where there was structure, the, the, all the rituals were in a sense their word of God. It was their truth, the presentation of the truth. And they couldn't just go off and have their own little temple service here or their own little Bible study over here because it would begin to deteriorate and they begin to add things to it, things from the culture. It's the same thing happens to the church today. The church has the Word of God, and when they just use a little piece of the Word of God and put little bits here and there, and they supplement the rest from culture, pretty soon the church is drifting into all kinds of different kinds of truths, and it's like, those are the high place. I'm not talking about any particular church. It may not even be happening anywhere, but potentially that could happen. But in, 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 in Josiah's day, coming off of Manasseh and some of the other kings, the people in different communities had gone off and had set up their own temples or their own worship centers, their own cultic centers. And it was very similar to the temple. They'd have Yahweh there. They'd have offerings there. They may have an incense altar. But they'd also add some things from their own culture, things that the priests were to be keeping track of or the Levites were to be observing. The people would just begin to add stuff to it. And, for example, at Arad, down south by Beersheba, we saw, there's pictures in the Hope for Mary's Last Generation book, but we saw it again. Uh, they've got a, te a little temple set up, but there's an altar. But they had two incense altars instead of one. And then when you went past the incense altars and stepped up two or three steps, there's a little area where there was two stones. Almost looked like the Ten Commandments. But those stones would represent the God or the gods. And in this case, the two incense altars, one was for indeed Yahweh, the God of Israel, and then one stone was for Yahweh, the God of Israel. Very nice, representing the Ark of the Covenant. They got it, got it appreciate their hard effort, but right there beside it was another altar which was for Asherah or Ashira, his girlfriend, his, his consort, his wife, his, what do you call it, consort, what's that word? You know, a, a concubine, concubine is not the word, consort, 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 I can never say that word, anyway, it was, yeah, that was who she was, and then she had her own stone there in the most holy place, anyway, this is the kind of stuff Josiah, when they got the law, they found the law during this reform here beginning in 632, they found the law of Moses, probably the book of Deuteronomy, and they read it and they realized, oh my goodness, we are so far off track. That that's when Josiah began a reform, which would have included destroying some of these high places, covering up. And can you imagine, can you imagine the public outcry? You know, you think... Here's Israel, they're following God, but they really weren't. They're following their own different religions. And here comes Josiah along and says, we're done with this. We're stopping this. We're shutting this down. Take down those high places. 
And it's like, not everybody was in agreement because a lot of people, that was their income, that was their occupation, that was the way they worship. Now they got to travel to Jerusalem for this crazy Passover once a year. Why can't we just do it at home on a, on a Saturday afternoon or whatever? And so there's all, and you just imagine all the different ripple effects that he had. So Josiah's public rating maybe wasn't very high. We look at him as a great king, but he was rocking the boat. He was changing society. And that is what begins here on our chart, uh, Religious Reform 630. You can see Josiah is going to live down until 610, 609 during this time. And what takes place, if you don't mind me, I, I'm going to start rambling here and, and just kind of trying to catch up on this information. I want to read some out of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and I just kind of read the biblical account. But I think first we'll look at this chart right here. During these days uh, of Josiah's reform, uh, a prophet arose, and that was Jeremiah. That's where we begin, Jeremiah chapter 1. We won't start there tonight, but when we do, we'll start there. And God is going to call Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is going to come alongside Josiah. And King Josiah is going to have the, the, the political side. Uh, Jeremiah is going to have the religious side or the spiritual side of this reform. Jeremiah is a priest. His father was a priest. He was from the city of Anathoth. Anathoth is, you can see it on your maps, three miles uh, northeast of Jerusalem, up by Shiloh. It's on the Benjamin Plateau. Here we go. <laughs> Get the maps out and start finding. But you can, you know, if you were just in, in the Benjamin Plateau, you can see kind of where it would be similar to Shiloh, uh, uh, Sechem, Samaria, and that kind of part. It was not that far north, but it looks like that. And uh, it's a smaller village. It was one of the villages that uh, Joshua took and gave to the Levites. Remember, the Levites didn't have any property. When the Levites came in the land, they, they put the tribe of Benjamin here, Manasseh here, Ephraim here, uh, Ishikar went up here, Judah and Simeon went down south. The Levites had no land. They were, their portion was the temple or the tabernacle. But they needed cities to live in, so they scattered cities throughout all the different tribes in the land of Israel. And the Levites were the teaching tribe. It was a brilliant idea. That means each of the tribes would have different cities within their area where the Levites would live or the priest would live. And they would serve in the temple, but then they'd come back home to their, their Levitical city. And hopefully they would then inspire the people. They'd live the life. They'd be there to have, you know, Bible studies or whatever it took to help keep the tribes on track. As you can see in the book of Judges, for example, how corrupt the Levitical or the Levites had become already, that they weren't helping anybody. Nonetheless, one of the cities that Joshua gave the Levites was Anathoth, three miles northeast of Jerusalem. And that's where Jeremiah was born. That's where Jeremiah grew up. Now, it doesn't appear he entered the priesthood. He didn't enter the priesthood until they were 30 years old. Now, that should spark a memory or a thought. Who else was a prophet at this time who was also a priest that was going to enter the priesthood at the age of 30? It was going to be Ezekiel. Ezekiel's uh, not born yet at this time. Uh, I think you can see Ezekiel. I've got him put down here. Guess is he'd be born in 622 is about the time Ezekiel and Daniel were born. Those are, those are question marks. What's, is your camera on? I We're not know. seeing a red line right anymore. I mean, it's, yeah, I think it's it turned is. on, but is it recording? Yeah, it's oh, got oh, a red yep. okay. No, nope. Thank you. I appreciate that because, yeah, I'm heartbroken when I go home and I want to <laughs> upload it and there's nothing there. It happens. Um, but Ezekiel uh, is going to be taken captive and go to, Eze uh, go to Babylon. Uh, it's probably around 25, 26 years old. And so what ends up happening is, uh, and the book of Ezekiel begins, in his 30th year, God shows up. And that's when the, the vision begins. It's very interesting because that's when he would have entered the priesthood. And that's when God shows up in Ezekiel chapter 1 and calls him as a prophet to uh, Israel and, and the nation. So nonetheless, uh, Ezekiel was a priest, but he had, when he was taken captive, he never had, hadn't begun yet. And Jeremiah, we're going to assume, is in the same position. His father's a priest. He's been trained for the priesthood, but he's going to be called to be a prophet before he's 30 years old and before he actually begins to function as a priest. He's going to have access to the temple and his great sermon in Ch uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, the temple message, uh, where he, he comes and he addresses. It's his last message there in the temple. He preaches against the temple and he preaches against the priest. 
And he had access. His father had access. He grew up around the priest. But this is going to put him outside the temple. He was no longer going to be allowed to come into the temple because of his negative attitude and his sermon. This sermon in Jeremiah chapter 7 is going to be echoed again by Jesus. And we went through the book of Matthew at church. When Jesus is dressing down the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and, and on the Temple Mount, his final, well, on you know uh, Palm Sunday, then Monday and Tuesday, it, it is ringing with the sound of Jeremiah chapter 7. In fact, Jesus draws several verses and images from that chapter. And again, it's interesting because in Jeremiah chapter 7, uh, uh, the, the priests are going to be like, how can you say that about God's temple? He'll never allow this to happen to God's temple. And Jeremiah refers back to Shiloh. When Shiloh was destroyed by the Philistines, he said, like, look at Shiloh. There's nothing left. What do you think was special about that? Nothing, and God destroyed it. He'll do the same thing here. Now, Jesus is going to pick that same thing up in Matthew 23, 24, 25. When he says this, he echoes that, and he's talking about how you guys better straighten up because you will have this temple in, in Jesus' day will be destroyed. And he's got two, two examples. Shiloh, when the Philistines came in, Eli's day and destroyed the temp tabernacle. And then Jeremiah, chapter 7, predicting the same thing. And Jesus, you have no protection. If you're not walking with him, you're going to lose the whole thing. So that's a, that's a very important point there. Nonetheless, the reason I went on that tangent is Jeremiah was a priest, uh, but he probably hadn't entered the priesthood. Anyway, he's going to join up with Josiah here in, in these early years, and the two of them are going to do a great job and come against some public opposition. Now, as history goes on that current event on the right side, it's real important to kind of understand a little bit about this. And again, I, 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 again, I don't want to bore you with, with uh, details that you already know, but it is kind of important to get this a perspective. We've got Egypt down here. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea right here. Here's Jerusalem. Anathoth. Okay, up in this area here, we're going to have the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are the power of this time. Coming down and expanding. They've already destroyed the northern ten tribes in 701. They, they destroyed the northern ten tribes, took them captive, or not, excuse me, they dispersed them, they scattered them. The Assyrians, when they would conquer people, would take them and disperse them. They wouldn't take and keep them as a group, nor let them live here together because they'd have a revolt. So they would take some Jews and put them here, some Jews and put them here. They would scatter the Jews, but at the same time, they'd bring in some Gentiles. And that's what they brought in. They brought in some Gentiles to live in this land, to occupy this land. Completely takes people off, off guard, right? I mean, you mix up your religion, <coughs> mix up your language, mix up your land. And now you're like, how can you organize a revolt if you're just trying to get some crops to grow? You don't even know the language of your neighbors. They just divided and conquered. It's a brilliant idea. The Assyrians. Anyway, that's, again, when they intermarried, these Gentiles intermarried with the, uh, the Jews that were left in the land. What do you get? Samaritans. And this is the, that's who they're half Jews, half Gentiles. And the Jews that were taken eventually by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, they remained as a culture and they returned as a culture. They were the pure Jews and they did not like the half-breeds up here. And that caused, obviously, strife. Even in Jesus' day, there's still conflict between the two groups. Especially in Ezra and Nehemiah, you can hear a lot about that. Okay. The Assyrians had already destroyed Israel in the north and as many of us know, the people from Israel, when they saw him coming, they fled down to Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem's walls expanded around 700 B.C. And you can still see the remains of those walls that expanded as the city expanded west. That's when Hezekiah had to dig Hezekiah's tunnel to get water to the other side of the city. He had just, he is a booming city during Hezekiah's reign around 700 uh, uh, B.C. Anyway, that's the Assyrians. And so the Assyrians are a power. During the, the, the final days of Israel, they sent a prophet, a prophet, the same prophet who went over here and anointed Jehu to be the next king of Israel. That same prophet was called to go up to the capital city of, of, of the Assyrians, Nineveh. And that's the story of Jonah. He was supposed to go up, but he didn't want to go. He ends up going. And he preaches to them, and of course, they repent. A very interesting study on what did he preach and how did they respond. A very interesting study because you've got Gentiles up here receiving a prophet from God, and what does he tell them? Very, just, you've just got to kind of process it. He doesn't give them the Ten Commandments. He doesn't give them the tabernacle or temple worship. He doesn't give them, you know, the laws of Israel. He tells them to repent and there's some, they understand some basic 
social requirements of how to behave, and they do repent, and God spares them. Just an interesting study, how you <coughs> the difference between God's expectation for his people to receive the law and his expectations for the others. And that leads me to another point, I can't forget where I'm at, is these prophets were called, Jeremiah, you know how it's going to begin, you know how the book of Jeremiah begins. I've called you to be a prophet to the, how does it begin? Nations, plural. He wasn't called just to be a prophet to Judah or to Israel. He was called to be a prophet to the nations, as was Ezekiel. And we're going to get to some chapters right around chapter 40 to 50. There's a series of prophecies to Ammon and Moab and Philistia and Egypt and Babylon. All these, Jeremiah is speaking to these people. Same way as you see Micah and Amos do it, you see Jonah go up here to Nineveh, and Ezekiel is going to have a set of chapters that are addressed to the nations. He talks to his people, he talks to them about the law, about coming back to what God expects, about the proper temple worship or tabernacle worship. But when they speak to these other nations, it's not about the law of Moses, it's not about sacrifices, it's about, in a sense, social action, if you want to say it that way. It's all kind of a scary thing coming out of the 60s. But it's like it's, it's about proper interaction between people. Uh, the government treating the people right. The rich treating the poor right. Uh, masters treating the slaves right. Uh, families acting right. That is what he was expecting from uh, the, the Gentiles. And those prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they had messages for all of them. Nonetheless, Jonah went up here and spoke to Nineveh, and they repented. Jonah didn't want to go because he knew that if they repented, they'd be spared. If he could just let them stay under the wrath of God. I mean, Jonah was a believer. I mean, he believed in God so much so that when he sees these people living wicked, he says, problem solved, God is going to smoke them. <laughs> he trusts God. And God says, go tell them to repent. Oh, no, I was counting on you smoking them. It's like, and he, I'm not going to. Because he knew they were, they, were, they were the ones who were going to destroy his society. So eventually, you know, the story of the whale and everything. He goes up there, he preaches to them, and they repent. And Jonah, just like a good Christian, is ticked off. And he's more upset about his, the heat and sitting in the sun. And he's uncomfortable. And, and then God's saying, hallelujah, they've all, all been spared. And Jonah says, my plant died. And, you know, it's just a very comical ending of the book. The prophet's more concerned about his comfort than he is about the people, which is very interesting. Anyway, uh, they're spared, and they're actually given as history would show, 200 more years of time. But Nahum comes up and prophesies to them and says, it's over. You have gone too far. You're not going to recover. And indeed, Nahum's prophecy comes true, and they fall. If you look on these notes right here, uh, you can see in, in the year 627. Now, again, this is, very, this is all the background of Jeremiah. He, Josiah and Jeremiah are having religious reforms down here in Judah. Israel is already gone. Israel has already been removed by the Assyrians. There's no tribes up north. There's Samaritans forming in, in the north. But Josiah and Jeremiah are having reform. During this time, uh, chapters 1 through 3, about 627, Arshurbanipal dies, and he is the last great king of the Assyrians. Arshurbanipal dies. Assyria is in a decline. Nahum's prophecy is coming to pass. Jonah saved them, Nahum warned them, they didn't repent, they're declining. And Arshabat, they're unraveling, the, the, the culture is unraveling. Over here, further to the east, <laughs> over by Babylon, the Euphrates River, there's a bunch of what they call Chaldean tribes. Just little divided little groups, they fight against each other. It's a great little situation for the Assyrians, because this whole group of people over here, they're fighting with each other. Who wants whose garden and stuff like this? They're just fighting, little tribe, tribal fighting. But a guy by the name of Nabopolazar, a chieftain from one of the tribes, just like always in history, there's always someone that arises out of the midst of all the average people, and he says, come on, guys, we just keep stealing each other's tomatoes. He says, let's, let, let's get organized. And he organized the tribes, Nabopolazar did. He had some kind of a peace treaty with them. He became the leader of all the other chieftains. And they set up an economy. They set up their military. And he says, our problem is not each other stealing tomatoes. Our problem is the Assyrians. And about the time Nabopolazar is giving that kind of a sermon, Arshurbanipal dies, the last great king of the Assyrians. They're declining as their, their rulership is declining. Their economy is on the fritz. And Nabopolazar says, these are our enemy. And so he begins to put pressure on the Assyrians. Now, down here in Judah, 
Guys like Hezekiah, uh, uh, Josiah, they've all been, beginning, been being pressured by the Assyrians. Remember, Assyria's already destroyed Israel. They haven't destroyed Jerusalem and Judah, although Sennacherib tried. Remember, Sennacherib came down and he tried, and then 185,000 died. And he went back and never came back and messed with them. But they still are under tribute. They still have to pay taxes. They still have to deal with as far as trade. And if we go back and we study the trade routes coming from Egypt up through the north up here, any kind of a trade route, Assyria's got their fingers in it. They're getting some money from the trade routes. They're getting money for their military. They're getting all, and they're just being oppressed. It'd be a whole lot nicer if the Assyrians weren't bothering Judah. So now just think, when Nabopolassar begins to arise over here with the Chaldeans, Arshur Banipal dies and they begin to decline. Who is Judah cheering for? Are they cheering for the Assyrians to make a comeback? Or are they cheering for these Chaldean tribes to kind of put some pressure on these guys? Obviously, you know, they're cheering for the Babylonians, which the Chaldeans are going to become the Babylonians, to put some pressure on these Assyrians so we get some pressure. But there's also a powerhouse down here called Egypt. And that's kind of the case right here. Arshur Banipal dies, Nabopolassar is rising. Assyria is collapsing. Uh, also in 624, another guy, Zephaniah. We'll want to touch on some of these prophets as we go by. Zephaniah is prophesying right here. So when you read Ze Jeremiah, the first three chapters of Jeremiah, Zephaniah is happening at the same exact time. Then in 623, this is when the law is found. That's when we, we pick up the story in 2 Chronicles, where Josiah, be, he's began his religious reformations, but now he's got the text. He's got the book of Deuteronomy. Is that not just amazing? Is that just boggle your mind that they're the Jews with the temple and they've lost the scriptures and they they read the book of Deuteronomy? It's like I've never heard this before. That, that, that just it's like are you are you kidding me? That someone must have a copy somewhere. But that's how bad guys like well, we got Josiah right now. His dad was Am Ammon, A Ammon, is it Amnon, Amnon, and his dad was Manasseh. Uh, so Grandpa Manasseh was Josiah's grandfather. Amnon reigned for two years, and then he died, leaving Josiah, I think, was he eight years old when he begins? He was eight years old when he became king. Okay, deal with that. Uh, Manasseh reigned for 55 years, and he was a terrible, wicked king. Probably must have been a pretty good king politically. He hung around for 55 years. But he was taken by the Assyrians in his 50th year, 49th year, right around there, was taken by the Assyrians over to Babylon. Now keep that in mind. Grandpa Manasseh was taken to Babylon, which means that's the Babylonian city. The Assyrians took him captive to Babylon. That's where they operated from. The Assyrians operated out of Babylon. And that's where Manasseh was taken. He was kept in prison for a couple of years there. And then it says he repented. And God allowed him to be restored. He went taken off with a hook in his jaw, they said. They took him away. And he came back. It's very interesting when he came back. And we'd like to read about it. But when he comes back, uh, he's back. I think he's back for six years. That must mean it would be like his 49th year or something he's taken captive. But uh, he comes back for six years, his last six years, and realize Josiah is going to grow up. Those four, just very interesting, those formative years of Josiah, years two through eight, no, no, excuse me, excuse me, zero through six are going to be in Grandpa Manasseh's palace. Before Manasseh was taken to Babylon, Manasseh was a wicked king. He basically trashed the temple. There was a Shira poles or Ashra poles. All, I mean, they couldn't even find, that's what I'm saying. In Josiah's day, they find the book of Deuteronomy. Where is it? Why did you lose the Bible? Manasseh, right? He's the one right here. It was completely taken care of. They brought in all of the Assyrian gods. On the street corners, they would have altars for the Assyrian gods. They were playing in. Again, it's hard for us to understand it, maybe, because, you know, we can separate, and in a general sense, we can separate the political world from the religious world. You understand? We can have Democrats and Republicans vote over here, and we all come to church in the same, you know, we can do that. It's probably happening here tonight. I mean, we can separate the two. In their world, government, gods, all this was all kind of more blended together. And so when the Assyrians came in, they wanted their culture, they took their gods, and they brought their own, they brought, the allowed the Assyrian gods here, Manasseh did, into the city. 
So the old way of Judaism was being set aside and Manasseh was compromising to go with the Assyrians. Now, when he comes back after he repented in prison, he comes back and you can read about it in, in the scriptures, he does several things. He tried to bring reform, but the culture is so far gone and, and, and he's an old guy who just came out of prison. They're not responding to him, but he tried. He also says began to rebuild some of the fortresses, the walls, the military, because he had seen firsthand Assyrian power, and he realizes they are not our friends. So he began the, the, the concept of the peace treaties and the negotiations and disarmament that he'd been playing for some 50 years. He came back and says, no more disarmament. He'd seen the beast. We're going to build our walls. He began to prepare the, repair the breaches in the wall. He began says, we are in trouble. And he tried to bring his society back. He dies, and his son Amnon becomes king. He dies after two years. Amnon tried to undo everything his grandfather, his father did those last few years. He undid everything, and then he dies. Then that brings Josiah in. And I remembered, I don't know, the Bible doesn't make a connection there, but it's just hanging there. Josiah, between years of zero and six, was growing up in a palace where Grandpa Manasseh had seen the beast. He had repented, and he was trying to bring his people back to God. That might be, this is all speculation, that might be why Josiah, when he was 8 and then 12 and then 16 years old, at the age, I think it was 12, I think it was age 12, he began to seek the God of his fathers, and then by 16 he began to have national reform. That may all just be a carryover from Grandpa Manasseh's lifestyle those first six years. There's some encouragement for grandparents right there, is, uh, you know, that, that, that six years right there can make a huge difference in someone's life. Anyway, that kind of sets the stage for the Assyrians and how powerful they were and how Israel had been oppressed in a sense or compromised with the Assyrians. Now, here we go again. The Assyrians have, are getting weaker. Nabopolassar over here is growing in power. He's, his, his forces are united. He's got a son, and you know what his son's name is. His son's name is Nebuchadnezzar. I say it like that so I can spell it. It's Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar's son is a general. He is the general of the, of the Chaldean army. Of all the troops that have been united by the chieftain, Nebuchadnezzar is their general. He has also been trained in architecture. He's, that's his training. He's an architect by training. He's an engineer. He loves building, but he's a general right now. He's soon going to become the king. And he's going to, of course, as you know, he's going to build Babylon up to a, a fantastic city because of his background. He's an architect. He's an engineer. That's what he wants to do. But he's got to be the general now because dad's the king and he is going to have battles against these Assyrians. And again, the Assyrians are crumbling. And here's just set this case. Judah. Now, who is Judah cheering for between Nebuchadnezzar and the crumbling Assyrians? Judah is cheering for the Babylonians because once these guys back off, they don't know what's going to, they don't know how big this is going to get. That's why Jeremiah is going to come and tell them, <laughs> These guys are going to get very big. You've got to look out for these guys. Egypt is going to be cheering for the Assyrians. They don't want the Assyrians. They don't want a new power to come in because they're just far enough away. They've got some nice trade routes here. They don't want the influence of these. So you've got these guys are pro-Babylon in a general sense. These are still pro-Assyrian. They want to keep the old school. These guys want the change. These guys don't want anything to change. And so that's going to lead to that battle in the Battle of Megiddo, Valley of Armageddon, uh, Jezreel Valley, when Nebuchadnezzar is going to go off at Carchemish. You can see it on your maps, this, this Battle of Carchemish. Nebuchadnezzar, let's see where we're at here on our notes here. Um, is it on here? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. We got Nineveh falling in 612. General Nebuchadnezzar defeats Assyria, and Josiah dies right there in 608 and 609. So they're going to come up here, they're going to have this battle, and they're going to win, and Assyrian's going to fall. But what takes place here is Nebuchadnezzar is on the march. He marches up the Euphrates River, crosses over, and meets the Assyrians. The death blow to the, they've already crumbled, they just need to be finished, and Nebuchadnezzar needs to claim their territory. Egypt doesn't want the Assyrians to fall. So Egypt marches up this way, the, the trade routes right here, they're going to go right through the Megiddo Valley. We've got three different routes they could come through to get through that valley. But Josiah says, no, I, want, I don't want to help the Assyrians. My grandfather helped the Assyrians. We got all their false religions here. I'm trying to stop this culture in my own country. I don't want them. So Josiah is going to meet Necho, Pharaoh Necho, 
And here it says, no, you can't come through the, the, the Megiddo passes. I'm going to block it. You can't come through here. You stay there. I'm going to ward this off. Pharaoh Nekel tells him, don't do this. I'll kill you if you get in my way. In fact, Nekel says very interesting. He says, how do you know you're supposed to stop me? He says, the Lord told me to go up here and help the Assyrians. And, and Josiah says, well, no, I'm following. They're both claiming to follow the Lord. They're, everybody's following their God in this. There's no, there's no secular humanist here. There's no atheist here. He's following Nebuchadnezzar's named after Nebo, the god of the, Assyri or the, the, Can uh, the, the Chaldeans. These guys are following their gods. He's following the Lord. He's following. They're all following God. Well, you know the story. Josiah is killed at a young age right here in this battle as Necho goes up to help the Assyrians against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar crushes the Assyrians and drives the Egyptians back down. Now, that doesn't mean Nebuchadnezzar wins the whole map. He wins this area crushing the Assyrians, but this area right here remains under Egyptian control. So Egypt is still up here in Syria and Israel. And, of course, in Egypt, they still have that. That's a battle that's yet to be taken place. Um, Josiah dies, and Pharaoh Necho takes a uh, Jehoiada. Okay, right here. Okay, Josiah, are you still with me? Yeah. Josiah's got a son named Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz, spelled how the paper says. He's also got a son named Jehoiakim. And he's got a son named Zedekiah. Jehoiakim is going to have a son named Jehoiachin. Okay? So here's dad, Josiah, and his three sons, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. Just so you know, Zedekiah is going to be the last king of Judah. Jehoiakim is going to be a king for a, a, a quite a while. Uh, he's going to make some bad mistakes. He's going to try to outmaneuver Nebuchadnezzar and rebel against him, which it's like revolting against the Romans. Don't do that. Jehoahaz is going to be the first one. When Josiah dies, Egypt claims this territory, and Necho, Pharaoh Necho, places Jehoahaz on the throne. So now he says, go ahead. Just the line of David will continue to rule, but I will put you in power, and I'll take you out of power. So now we got in Judah, the first son of Josiah, Jehoahaz, is the king. Now, Egypt controls this right here. Let me come back to our chart right here. Uh, we got Habakkuk 1, 2, and 3. You need to read Habakkuk 1, 2, and 3, because that's where, where Jeremiah is starting to say, ah, Nebuchadnezzar is the new coming king. God is going to hand everything over to Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to punish us if we don't repent. And Habakkuk is getting the same message. Zechariah is getting, uh, Zephaniah is getting the same message. You, you understand? It's very interesting. We've got, it's not just Jeremiah out there on a limb. God's got several prophets saying the same thing. What's interesting about Habakkuk is this. Habakkuk is a great uh, a patriot. He's a great believer. He's a good Jew, Habakkuk is, the prophet. And his message that he's being given by God is, I'm going to punish you and your people with the Babylonians. And if you read Habakkuk, he said, what? How does that make any sense? They're, they're more unrighteous. Than, I know we've got problems, but they're completely wicked. They follow demons. They follow idols. They follow false gods. They're uh, uh, abusive in battle. They're a terrible people. And again, that's how Habakkuk is complaining to God about, how is this even fair? How can a righteous God punish us with someone more wicked than us? And it, you can read the, the dialogue. It's very interesting because he has a, a debate with God. Jeremiah, when we get into the book of Jeremiah, there's going to be a time where Jeremiah is going to have a debate with God, and he's going to say, if you don't mind me going off on this too, because this is one of the great parts of Jeremiah, at least for me, is Jeremiah, again, during this reform down here with Josiah and, and the people coming against him, Jeremiah is going to be rejected from the temple. He's going to be rejected by the people. The royalty is going to reject him. They're going to you know, burn his letters and, and come against him. They're going to put him in a cistern, put him in a pit, put him in the courtyard, put him in prison. He's going to go through all of this trouble, and finally, he says, uh, he's going to tell God, he says, he says you, you, be, you, you betrayed me. I thought if I was your prophet, I could say, say things and things would work out for me, that I would be telling other people bad things happen, but myself, I would be spared. He kind of got that attitude. Woe is me. And God comes while Jeremiah is whining and complaining to him. And he actually is. He's, Job complains to God about his situation. Habakkuk complains to God. Jeremiah complains to God. Now, what's interesting about this, now get this in your minds, when you complain to God, the amazing thing is, God in the Bible 
always answers. You know, it's like, well, we shouldn't complain. I, I just want to be positive. The, the people that got some response from God when they came and says, I don't think this is right. I think you're treating me unfairly. Job said it. Uh, Jeremiah is going to say it. Habakkuk is going to say it. And God comes up. Let me explain this to you. God always responds to, to uh, it's just interesting, uh, not fake praise and oh I just love the Lord but it's like actually talking and like what are you doing this doesn't make any sense and God always well let me explain it to you and, and leads them along and they always come out stronger uh, as they go through this anyway Jeremiah is going to say this and God says to Jeremiah he says uh, if you've raced against men and got tired how are you going to race against horses he's like God said I've got you you're complaining about having to compete against men I've got a race plan for you where you're going to be competing against horses which if you think about it, that's like, you know, racing cars on foot. Because I, I'm taking you to a whole supernatural level, but you won't get past this, this man versus man competition. I'm going to have you race horses. He says, and you're, you're stumbling on safe country. You're stumbling, he says, you're stumbling like on a road race. You, you run like we run road races on a road, you know, on blacktop. God says, I, I, you're, you're getting tired and stumbling on, in a road race on the blacktop. How are you going to ever race through the thickets of the Jordan, you know, cross country through weeds? He said, I've got, I've got you running through things that you can't even run through. I'm going to have you run through them. He says, but Jeremiah, if you're going to complain about racing against men and racing on, on flat pavement, how are you ever going to race against horses and race through places that are impassable? He said, I think you better straighten up, Jeremiah. It's just very interesting. Jeremiah whining about how tough his life is. God says, I've got bigger things planned for you, but if you're going to fade right now, just forget it. I've got better things. And it's like, Jeremiah, you know, I don't know if you, that, that really ministers to me. I'm not sure about you. <laughs> anyway, because it's like, I'm tired of this. It's like, hey, if you're fading right here, you're never going to get out of the supernatural where I've got you going. Anyway, that's kind of interesting. Uh, why am I saying all that? Somehow that ties into this. I was talking about Jeremiah and, and, and he's complaining. Uh, Zedekiah, Jehoahaz. All right, let's go back to this. Necho is in this area right here. He places Jehoahaz in charge. But Nebuchadnezzar is going to come down here and fight against the Egyptians. And that's where we're at right here. He's not going to back off right here. He's with the Assyrians. He's going to continue his pursuit of Necho. He's defeated the Assyrians. And now he's going to put pressure on Syria and, and Israel and drive Necho back into Egypt. That's where we're at right now. Uh, Pharaoh Necho in the year 608 places Jehoaz on the throne. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. I, did you catch that? Did anybody see I made a mistake? Uh -huh. Thank you. Jehoahaz inherits the throne from Josiah, his father. When Necho comes back through, he takes Jehoahaz with him to Egypt, and that's how Jehoiakim ends up becoming king. So Jehoahaz goes down here. I, I said that wrong. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Sorry. Um, okay, we're, oh, we're on Habakkuk. The reason I got off on all that was Habakkuk 1, 2, and 3. Because there you've got a prophet complaining about this whole world scene. And he's saying, how does this even make sense? And God kind of explains it to him. Very, I, I really like the book of Habakkuk. Um, we, we'll maybe touch on it later. Uh, anyway, okay, now in 605 at Carchemish, Egypt is defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, who's the son of Nabopolazar. And Nabopolazar has his son driving them back. And, uh, and here's what happens. Here's the battle. He's driving Necho down. He gets right about into here. Necho's being driven down. Nebuchadnezzar, for Nabopolazar, his father, has taken the Assyrian area. He's driven Egypt out of Syria, drove, has driven them out of Israel. And so he basically occupies all this. But before he goes into Egypt, he gets a message. I mean, not like a spiritual message, but a message from a, someone comes running. Guess what, Nebuchadnezzar? Your dad died. The king is dead. Oh. So here's the rightful king now in the middle of a battle on the border of Egypt, way back here in, 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 in Babylon, there's no king. And you believe me, Nebuchadnezzar, remember, Nebuchadnezzar is not in the line of Davidic kings. He's the first king that's organized these tribes. So his kingdom, his political reign is, is in a sense, weak. Once he's dead, guess what? People are jockeying for his position, including some brothers of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is the rightful king. So guess what he has to do? Stop this pursuit and hightail it as fast as he can back to Babylon. And that's where now you're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. Because on his way by, he tells his, his troops or he tells his generals, let's get the royal kids out of, this, out of this palace right here, grab the royal children, and get them over here. 
It's the first of the captivities. It's the year 605, and Daniel is taken back. Why? As a, basically as a hostage. That's going to be the initial thing. Is, so I don't lose control of this area, and Israel doesn't reunite with Egypt. I'm going to take their kids, the royal children, the sons of David are going over here. We'll leave Jehoiakim in charge. Jehoiakim is the king in Nebuchadnezzar's place. Jehoahaz is down here with Necho, and Nebuchadnezzar goes back over here. And he's, got to, he's going over there for one main reason, establish himself as the king. Daniel goes back, one, as a hostage, but two, they're going to, and you know the story of Daniel, they're going to renew their minds to Babylonian thinking. They're going to do exactly what the Greeks did uh, during the Maccabean Revolt. They came in and they, they Hellenized the Jews. Every, they went to the chariot races, they had the theater, they spoke Greek, they changed their clothes style to Greek clothes style. They were Hellenized. And it has nothing to do with hell, it has to do with Helen, the, the, the woman from Greece. Uh, that, that, you know, the war, the Trojan War, Hellenized. They became Grecian. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do that ahead of time. So what you see beginning here, if you want to play this off onto a, a satanic role, is as far as Satan or the world system, they want to, the Assyrians, try to override the system, God's plan. Nebuchadnezzar knows, I'm going to take the royal children just like the Assyrians did. I'm going to bring the royal children over here. I'm going to brainwash them into being Chaldean, and I'm going to send them back, and I'll have this area under control. It, it's a way of controlling kids and controlling a culture, and it's sane. And that, if that, when that doesn't work, uh, you're going to have the Greeks are going to do the same thing, Antiochus Epiphanes, the solutions. They're going to do the same thing, and Jesus and all the apostles are going to deal with the whole, whole concept there. Okay. Uh, General, he goes over here, he, he, General uh, Nebuchadnezzar becomes King Nebuchadnezzar, he regains his throne right there, and he goes off and has to fight, he has to come back down here and fight the Egyptians and, and defeats them, drives them back again later, stay with me, but when he comes back that second time, he's going to call, that's when in Daniel chapter 1 and 2, he calls for the, the, the children. He goes back, regains his throne, comes back on the battlefield and is fighting the battle within a few months, it's back on the battlefield. Daniel and his Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the other guys are going through training. Nebuchadnezzar gets this area under control, comes back over there, and that's when he calls for him. I want to see the, I want to test them. That's when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego appear ten times wiser in their training and all the things that they're doing. And that is when Nebuchadnezzar is going to have that vision. He's going to have a dream. He recognizes Daniel, Shadrach, these are great guys. But then he has a dream, and all of his magicians can't answer the dream. You know the story. And so he says, all right, kill everybody. Kill them all. Why? Why does he want to kill everybody? Because he's, he's been king for like about 18 months. His dad was king and organized everything. As soon as his dad dies, everybody wants to take over his position. So he doesn't trust anybody. He's got these magicians who are his, his advisors, and they're throwing kind of junk at him. He says, listen, if you're really magicians, if you're really wise men, if you really got connection with the spirit, then you tell me what my dream was. You know the story. And they go, no king has ever asked that. He says, no group of people have ever said they've got power like you've got. You're magicians. You can see in the spiritual realm. Tell me what my dream was. That's ridiculous. We don't have that kind of power. <laughs> well, then, I don't even need you. If you don't have that kind of power, then I'm going to kill you all. Because you're worthless. I need supernatural wise men, not people. And they were political. A lot of them were political enemies. In fact, when you get into the Persians, a lot of those magi continue into the Persian time period. And one of those, those magi actually becomes uh, one named Pseudo Smyrtus, who's going to become a, a false Smyrtus. He, he fakes that he's one of the sons and takes over the Persian Empire for a while. And so they, these magicians were not, in many cases, not trustworthy. And so he said, I'm going to kill all of them. And that's when Daniel hears it, you know, the stories. that will give us a chance. And they pray, and they pray, they seek God all night. And Daniel has the same dream. He comes in, he says, I've got the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, when he tells him the dream, realizes, oh, huh, this is something special. And he says, you've got the spirits of the gods in you. Of all those wise men, he had one that was truly connected spiritually to the God of, cre of the, the God of the Creator, and he gave him the answer. And of course, if, if I push the story, I'm going to have to wrap this up. By the end of the book of Daniel, and you read it, you decide for yourself. By the end of the book of Daniel, I think Nebuchadnezzar becomes a believer. Remember, he goes off for seven years. He's insane. I'll throw this at you too. Neb Daniel was trusted by Nebuchadnezzar. He brought him into the court. And I believe, speculating, this is speculation, that when Nebuchadnezzar went insane for those seven years, he came back from being insane, and guess what? He came right back to his throne and sat down. It's like, 
who can be insane for seven years in exile, crawling around like an animal eating grass, and after you repent and you come back, your throne is still, we've been waiting for you, king, here's your throne. The kingdom's running fine, the economy's at the best it's ever been. Is there anything else I can get for you? My speculation is, and you, you really have to argue against this, that Daniel ran the place while Nebuchadnezzar, his master, was off going in crazy. I mean, the only thing he was missing, he just, everything stayed under, stayed under control. Daniel, he hands it right back to him. And Nebuchadnezzar, if you read that statement, he gives a decree again, there's no God higher than this God right here, the God of Daniel. He became, in a sense, a believer. Now, did he accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Okay, well, that's difficult to do in, in 580, you know. Did he, did he offer sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem? No, he didn't do that either. It wasn't required of him. The Jews did that. But as a Gentile, I believe he came to an understanding of the God of, of, of Daniel. And again, mess with that, toy with that, how you ever want to do that. But I think he became a, a believer uh, in, in, in that time. And of course, that's going on down the road a little bit. That kind of sets the stage uh, where we're at. Uh, there's many things that are going to take place. I, will, I wanted to read some things out of the Bible uh, for background on this. But I kind of told you the story. Uh, the, you want to read this, I, you, you can find it yourself. But 2 Chronicles chapter 35, beginning there, you can read to the end of the book. If you start in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 20 or so, you read to the end of 2 Chronicles, you're going to get the whole story. And all, all the book of Jeremiah is going to overlay on that. It's, it's not just isolated somewhere. And the same thing, 2 Kings chapter 23, the same story. The difference possibly between Chronicles and Kings is Chronicles seems to have been written by the priests or the spiritual leaders, and they've got more of a, uh, an approach from the spiritual value of what's going on. Kings seems to have been written, a general statement, is by the scribes in the palace. They're talking about the political activity more on the the day-to-day -day routine. One's more spiritual, one's from the political side. You've got the two sides telling the same story. Um, anyway, and then Jeremiah is going to overlay that. Another thing you can look at while we go through this is all the chapters. And the chapters kind of overlay. And it's interesting to know these events because if you don't understand the events, it's really hard to dig your teeth into the chapters of Jeremiah other than just becoming mystical with them and saying, well, I just feel God's telling me this, which is true. The Bible speaks to us, but it's nice to have a historical context so you don't get the wrong you know, implication of what's being said. Uh, one thing I'll tell you, too, and you're, you're free to change these chapters, the positions as you go through it, as you study. In the, in the parentheses towards the right of that middle column in italics, those are alternate placements for those chapters. Ezekiel, it's very easy because Ezekiel tells you on the fifth year of captivity, the third month on the second day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon right after I got done getting a quick trip slushy, God spoke to me. And so, I mean, you can date it, you know. Uh, Jeremiah, not so often. It's just, you almost got to pick, got to read what is being said and try and say, now when would he have said, how does this put in there? Uh, the book of Jeremiah is organized in this fashion on purpose. And again, that comes to some speculation. Jeremiah is going to end up in Egypt. After all is said and done, he's going to endure the first, second, and third captivity. He's going to endure the destruction of the city. He's going to write the book of Lamentations as he watches the city burn and people die in the streets. He's writing it. There's a couple psalms that tie into the destruction of Jerusalem as Jeremiah watched the thing burn down and they chopped the temple apart. He talks about the wood burning, in, in, or the Psalms talks about the wood burning in the most holy place as they just chopped through God's temple. He sees that. The captives go. Jeremiah is in chains at uh, the high place of Gibeah. Remember the high place of Gibeah uh, when we were up there uh, where you can see Jerusalem, the high place of Gibeah, Gibeah right there with the Gibeonites down at the bottom of the high place. They were taking them out of Jerusalem, taking them to the north, as obvious. They're going to take them up north, and they stop there and camp for the night. Jeremiah is in chains with all the other captives that are being drug out. There's people bleeding and dying in the streets. There's smoke, and Jeremiah is in chains. And you can imagine Jeremiah thinking, I was the most obedient I'd try to do. I, I, why am I going into captivity? And he's, he's going with all the rebels into captivity. But Nebuzar Aden comes down with Nebuchadnezzar. He says, it's amazing. He says, find Jeremiah. Find Jeremiah, and they went searching through all the captives, all chained up, and they find Jeremiah at Gibeah, the high place there with all the captives, and they release him. 
and bring him to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuch you can read it in the book. Nebuchadnezzar says, he says, what, what do you want to do? What can I do for you? He says, do you want to come back to Babylon with me? You can live in the palace with Daniel. Where do you want to go? Do you want to stay here in the land? And Jeremiah says, I'll stay here in the land. And are you sure you want to stay in this mess? I want to stay in the land. This is my home. So they gave him a gift. They gave him the, the supplies that he needed. And says, Jeremiah, thank you very much for trying to help us out. Because he was, in a sense, he was a political friend. He tried to save them. He says, just surrendered. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to burn. That's a lot of work to burn a city to the ground. It'd be easier if they just threw a white flag up. Says, okay, well, how much tax do you want? How much tribute do you want? And we'll just give you some money. That's the easy way to win a battle. So anyway, that's what happened to Jeremiah. They put a guy named Gedaliah in charge. They put a guy, he's the governor. A bunch of people get together, they kill Gedaliah. And the people come to Jeremiah and they say, I I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm still rambling. They tell Jeremiah, please, we didn't listen to you the first 40 chapters, but we will listen to you now. The people that are left, obviously everything you said came to pass. What, what can we do? Can we go to Egypt or should we stay in the land? What, what do we do? Because Nebuchadnezzar, his troops are marching off. They've got everything under control. And he says, Jeremiah says, I'll inquire of God for you. But let me tell you, when I give you an answer, you better stink and listen this time because God is really ticked. They say, no, no, no. Whatever you say, and you know where this is going to go. Whatever you say, we will do. Okay, I'll be back in a couple days. He goes off, comes back. God says, I want you to stay in the land. Don't go to Egypt. I'll prosper you. I need you in the land. Stay here. So Jeremiah said, I got a word. God wants us to stay right here. He says, he'll bless us. We'll plant crops. We'll replenish us. We'll stay right here. But he says, do not go to Egypt. And they say, why are you trying to trick us? You're trying, you want us to get killed by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come back and kill us. We're going to Egypt. Really, no, really don't. Nebuchadnezzar is not mad at you. God's mad at you. Nebuchadnezzar wants you just to live here and plant crops. Don't be, you did that to us the first time. And they took him to Egypt. They, they drug him down to Egypt. And Jeremiah, when he gets there, I'm, I'm telling you the whole story. God tells him, okay, I want you to go dig a, dig a hole. There's a pavement out in front of the, like the major city square there. He says, D dig a, lift the pavement stones up and bury something right there. He says, because that's where Nebuchadnezzar is going to put his throne. Because Nebuchadnezzar, he's not going to destroy this land, so he's coming back to Egypt. He went back home, but he's coming back to Egypt. And then Jeremiah began prophesying Egypt. And all those people, it's really funny. I mean, if you've got a bad spirit about you, it's really funny. Because <laughs> all those people that were spared in this, kept in this destruction in Jerusalem and didn't listen to Jeremiah, they go down here to get away from Nebuchadnezzar. And, ne ne and Jeremiah says, no, Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy Egypt next. Don't go there. Stay here. You just wave as he marches by. No, we're going to go down here. Don't lie to us, Jeremiah. I know you're trying to kill us. So they went down there, and guess what? They got to endure another siege by Nebuchadnezzar in Egypt. And then, of course, you've got to imagine the bottom died the second time. And, that's, and we, lose track of, we lose track of Jeremiah. Uh, stories have it. He got stoned by the Israelites. No one knows uh, that he died of old age in Egypt. I like to end it this way. Nebuchadnezzar found him again and says, this time I'm not giving you a choice. You're going to come back and live in the palace with Daniel. That's all. That's no reason to believe that. But my reason I say all that is he was in Egypt after all this took place. And it appears one of the ideas is that Jeremiah took all of his notes, all of his prophecies that he had, and his, his, uh, his scribe Baruch had all these things that then they organized everything at time. They had several years there just waiting for Nebuchadnezzar to come destroy Egypt. Uh, they organized it in, in this fashion here, because this, this is the way it was handed down to us. And so that's scattered, but for some reason, possibly even Jeremiah put it in some kind of structural order, uh, because he had, it was like he got killed in the middle of a prophecy or something. So he, anyway, that's that story. I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll pick this up next week again. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity again to meet. I do ask that we would understand these things, that your spirit would speak to us and lead us as we understand the scriptures and we understand the, the history that's gone before us. We thank you for being a faithful God that spoke through Jeremiah and spoke to the people. And we also thank you for the word that we have today that we can learn from, that we can grow from, and that we can change our lives and we can make an impact in our world. And again, we pray for our nation. We pray for our churches. And I thank you for the people that are here tonight and ask that you reward them for the time they've invested in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much.